Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our Flex and Rigid Flex Printed Circuit Board Applications and Cost Drivers webinar. My name is Kendall Paradise, and I'm the president of Epic Engineered Technologies. Before we get started, I just wanted to let you all know that you will be muted during the presentation. If you have any questions as we move along, please enter them into the questions panel, which is located on the webinar control panel, and we will try to get to them all at the end of the presentation. Also, we will be recording this webinar, and we'll be posting both the recording and the slides on our website and our YouTube channel. Our presenter today is Paul Tomei, our product manager for Flex and Rigid Flex Print Circuit Boards. Paul's main responsibility at Epic is customer technical support, but he's involved in each product from the beginning conceptual stages through delivery. He works directly with all of our customers on specific design requirements and makes sure that all products are designed correctly and troubleshoots any problems that could come up in the manufacturing process. Paul came to Epic with over 25 years experience in the electronics industry, ranging from sales, engineering, and through manufacturing. Now I'll turn it over to Paul and we can get started. Thank you, Kendall. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks again for joining us. As Kendall mentioned, the topic that we'll be covering in this webinar today is the application and cost drivers as they relate to flex and rigid flex printed circuit boards. Flex and rigid flex applications are present in every single marketplace, every single market segment within the electronics industry. Everything from medical, avionics, instrumentation, industrial controls and sensors, automotive, wearable devices, military, etc. The list is the list is endless. And the applications cover both um, what the industry refers to as static or bend once to fit applications, and also dynamic movement applications where a flex circuit is required to bend up to and including an infinite number of times. Now, given the size of the marketplace, and on the screen now we'll have some examples, um, as you can see from laser gun sights, night vision goggles, defibrillators, the, it's, it's a very, very broad spectrum. Given the extent of the, uh, of the number of applications, I think the most relevant conversation is to identify and understand the primary factors as to why a flex or a rigid flex would be applied to a given design requirement. And the number one uh, requirement, and this is the, the majority of it, is one of packaging. Attempting to fit, um, for example, 10 pounds of product in the five pound box. The second most common requirement is that of reliability and improvement of. Between the two of these, they account for approximately they account for approximately 80 percent of all applications that we've encountered uh, over a significant period of time. The capabilities uh, of flex and rigid flex go much beyond all of the alternative interconnect solutions that are available, be them either cable harnesses, discrete wires, mating connectors, alternate interconnect solutions that may meet your design requirements may in turn provide cost savings but will not achieve as high a packaging density, reliability level, or ultimately the performance of the part itself. So getting into a little bit more detail, size reduction. Flex and rigid flex in their interconnect areas occupy down to as low as 10% of the space requirements of alternate solutions. They provide both the circuit density and capabilities of rigid printed circuit boards. They provide much better or much tighter bend capabilities than either wires or cable solutions. Uh, they're capable of reducing the rigid board real estate space requirements due to the elimination of connectors and ultimately create the opportunity for the potential of the reduction in the dimensions of the enclosure that the flex and rigid flex will be assembled to. Weight reduction, similar ratio, approximately 10% of the alternative solutions, be that either wire cables, stacking connectors, and so forth, and as a byproduct of the weight reduction provides a uh, substantial improvement in the shock and vibe performance of a given design. Flex and rigid flex also 
create the opportunity to uh, include added functionality into a design, uh, the opportunity for the uh, an increased number of interconnects between rigid areas within a rigid flux, for example, uh, may provide opportunities. Uh, they provide the opportunity to, to reduce the component requirements within a given design. Uh, specifically, connectors is a primary one, flex and rigid flex constructions. In the majority of cases, eliminate the requirements for connectors entirely. Uh, flex also brings into, uh, into play the opportunity to use ZIF connectors which are a one-part connector system specifically designed for the use with flex circuits. It is a, uh, the flex itself is the male portion of the mating connector. And then an, uh, lastly, an alternative method, and this one is used extensively in some industries um, where the flex is bonded directly to a rigid board by means of what's known as a lap joint. Uh, thus eliminating all connectors again completely. Uh, the opportunity exists for reducing the components as well. Um, inherently it brings a the opportunity of a higher uh, level of design density which in turn may, inter may create opportunities for component reduction. From a reliability point of view, number two on our list, the main methodology is through the reduction of the points of interconnect, uh, be that either solder joints for connectors, uh, mating interfaces between connectors, wire crimp or wire cable or crimp connections. These are all looked upon as potential points of failure within a given design and flex and rigid flex allow these points of interconnect to be either completely eliminated or substantially reduced thus inherently improving the reliability of a given design. And as previously mentioned, through their reduction in weight and the reduction in number of interconnects, that in turn translates again into improvement in the shock and vibe performance of a given design. There are some added elements, there are some added benefits that flex and rigid flex bring to the table. Um, they're very good from a high speed integrity point of view. They offer uh, exceptional performance over a wide range of requirements. The materials themselves, polyimid specifically, has a very, uh, has a lower decay value than rigid board materials. The materials themselves are very tightly controlled and uniform in material thickness. And they're also of a homogeneous core construction, which in turn allows for high speed integrity to perform exceptionally well. Uh, potential improvement in heat dissipation. The thinner materials and constructions allow the uh, dissipation of heat at higher rates. Uh, and in most cases, there's also a greater surface area to volume ratio, which in turn improves the heat dissipation capabilities. From an assembly point of view, uh, typically a flex and rigid flex will reduce the number of assembly steps required, which inherently will save some cost. And from an assembly errors point of view, a flex and rigid flex typically only installs one way and one way only, thus reducing any potential for assembly errors. So moving on into the cost drivers that are associated or involved in flex and rigid flex. And the most significant one is the size of the part itself, in a similar fashion as it is to rigid boards. Flex and rigid flex are manufactured in a production panel manufacturing process format, which is similar to that of traditional rigid boards. And this also applies to roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing. It is not exclusive. Multiple parts are arranged within the larger format production panel. Ultimately, the number of panels required to yield a required number of parts will in turn dictate the cost of the individual units. The more parts or the higher quantity of parts that can be panelized or configured within a production panel ultimately reduces the total material requirements and produces a lower per unit cost. The design configuration of a given part um, 
will also have a bearing on the unit cost. Uh, because of the inherent opportunity to integrate using Flex and Rigid Flex, taking that to an excessive level may in turn lead to a very large part configuration, which then may not uh, which will ultimately drive the cost of the unit upwards. We also encounter a situation where the overall length of the part may be a factor in its cost in that some lengths do not match well within an available production panel size and may result in a portion of unused production panel material which in turn will drive the cost of the parts upwards. From a part shape perspective, the technology of rigid and rigid flex and flex allows for many, many different unique configurations and shapes. And not all of these shapes and sizes allow for best utilization of the materials. The part shape and size combination may limit the ability to nest the parts within the production panel. And some designs that are circular or U-shaped with large empty sections will result in wasted material, which ultimately, again, uh, increases the per or has an impact on the unit cost of the part. And the two images that we show here below are pretty good examples where in this section, in this unit here, we've got a large empty section in the middle of the part. Again, that material is being unused and consumed. And in the rigid flex, got a very unique configuration that limits how the individual parts can be packaged into the production panel. So these are, these are considerations that need to be taken into account, preferably early on in the design process and understood. From a manufacturing point of view, there are some, there are requirements that come into play that in turn may impact the material utilization and the cost of the individual parts. Uh, manufacturing requirements may dictate that parts have to be oriented in a certain direction in order to uh, allow for stiffeners to be assembled, for example, PSAs to be attached, um, breakaway tabs between adjacent rigid areas in order to create an effective assembly array. And the example we have in between shown here below is a good indication of that, where this design uh, required this type of panel configuration, and you can see the extent of the unused space in between adjacent parts. The layer count construction of a flex, specifically, or more to the point of a rigid flex, um, will also have a significant bearing on the cost of the design. Additional flex layers, for example, within a rigid flex will drive the cost of the part up due to the added materials that are required and the added potential lamination processes that are required. The example below shows a traditional six layer rigid flex construction with two layers of flex existing in the center of the design at layers two and at layers three and four I should say. In the next image we have a same six layer construction within the rigid section but in this case we have four layers of flex. So we've now got an additional flex core, an additional flex bond ply to bond the layers together. We have an additional lamination process to laminate the flex layers together in advance of laminating the rigids, and all of those are cost drivers that need to be understood and factored into the design. Another item is that has a, a lesser impact, but is still one that needs to be understood, is the configuration of the uh, flex circuits. Again, this is an eight layer design. But a unique element of this design is that the flex circuits are configured as two individual pairs with an air gap in between them. So within the flex section, they are not, the two pairs are not um, laminated or interconnected to one another. Uh, improves the flexibility of a design, but does have an, a bearing on the cost as there's additional cover lay requirements, 
for each of the individual pairs and the lamination processes associated with that. Some of the additional cost factors that uh, can come into play uh, relate to the technology requirements of the given design and many of these are common to, some of these are common to rigid boards, uh, flex and rigid flex designs that have blind and buried vias uh, that require via fill for either VN pad or fine pitch BGA applications. Um, some flex circuits may have a requirement for plated holes within the flex area only of a rigid flex. Uh, these create added drilling and plating cycles, require a sequential build process. Stiffeners within uh, stiffeners in the flex, added materials, added lamination cycles. And a unique element uh, for rigid flex is the use of an epoxy strain relief, which exists at the point, and you can see, um, you can see in this example here where I'm, where my cursor is, there is a bead of epoxy applied at the transition from the rigid area to the flex area in order to meet a reliability requirement for a very tight bend situation. And those can become a significant cost factor depending upon the complexity of the design and how many of the epoxy strain reliefs are required on a per unit basis. In summary, our applications, the applications for flex and rigid flex are extremely varied and exist throughout all of our market segments. The majority of the applications from our perspective, somewhere greater than 80% are driven by either packaging and or reliability requirements, which alternative solutions just cannot support. From the review of the cost drivers, there are multiple factors that create in turn a wide variety of combinations which can impact the final part of the, the final cost of the part. We recommend that your supplier of choice assist and support you in, uh, in the development of the design. Um, your supplier should be able to support you in right from a conceptual level, from an application review, justifying the application of flex and or rigid flex to your design as being the optimum solution. Uh, understanding and developing the requirements for the part to ensure that it is functional, reliable, and meets all of your design requirements and ultimately looks at your design from a cost point of view in order to optimize the cost to the greatest extent possible collectively to make the project as successful as possible. Kendall? Thank you, Paul. Okay. Really quick, while Paul is going through the list of questions that were submitted during the course of the webinar, I wanted to take a moment and familiarize everyone who may not know about EPIC's other technologies and capabilities. Uh, just a very quick overview of what our product lines are. Uh, staying very similar to our Flex and Rigid Flex model, we have custom battery pack design, uh, high reliability user interface design, uh, fans and motors, table assemblies, as well as plain rigid printed circuit boards of all technologies. Next slide. For each of these product lines, we have design centers and technical support, similar to uh, what Paul did for everyone today. For our battery pack and power management um, business, our, tech, our design center is in Denver, Colorado. For our high reliability user interfaces, our tech center is in Largo, Florida. Uh, for our fans and motor business, we're based in Wales in the UK. For rigid printed circuit boards, New Bedford, Massachusetts, as well as our office is located in Shenzhen, China. For Flex and Rigid Flex, Paul's based in Toronto, Canada, and for our cable assemblies, they're in our headquarters in New Bedford as well. Our design, design and engineering teams are always ready and willing to help our customers continue, as Paul said, to focus on cost optimization and provide a world-class experience for all of your product solutions. So I think at this point, Paul's got a couple of questions ready to go, so I'll turn it back over to him, and everyone have a great weekend. Thank you, Kendall. So I've got three questions here that have come in, and uh, these questions have been uh, asked of us many times over in the past, so I think they're relevant to this discussion. So 
So the first question is, do manufacturing requirements impose a size limitation on either flex or rigid flex designs? And the answer to that is the maximum part to size uh, can become limited, and this is due to the accumulation of both material and manufacturing tolerances, specifically in higher technology designs where registration and layer-to-layer -layer alignment is, uh, is a important uh, criteria. Second question I have here is, is there a limit to the total rigid area layer count in a rigid flex design? In answer, in theory, no, but it can't be looked in isolation. It needs to be, uh, the design needs to be reviewed combined with all of the other technical requirements. And it's the combination of the layer count and the additional technical requirements uh, such as blind vias, buried vias, for example, that may in turn dictate a maximum layer count. And the last question I have here uh, is in regards to the thickness of rigid flex. Do all rigid sections in a rigid flex design have to be of the same thickness? The answer to that is, in general, yes, they do. And the reason is in order to avoid some very, very costly additional manufacturing processes. And then also, in addition, in many cases, it just may not be possible at all given the, uh, the configuration of the design. Well, we appreciate your attendance this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. And thank you very much.